Hello, everybody. Welcome to another dose of Dr. E and Dr. P. Today, we're going to talk about how to prevent your blood sugars from going through the roof after eating. We call it the post-meal spike. Yeah, you know, and Steve and I were actually having a conversation about just this topic with a really good friend of ours yesterday, and we, we filmed it, and we want to show you guys that. So have a look real quick. All right, listen up, Burger. We're going to eat you, okay? And we don't want you to make a big deal out of it and make our blood sugars go all high. Hey, hey, hey. Don't look at me like that. We go through this every frickin' time. Please stop the whining. All right. We all know what happened last time when I ate your brother. My <laughs> blood sugar went through the roof and I took a ton of insulin and then my blood sugar went low. And yeah, I said some hurtful things, okay? We know, we know. We said we're sorry. Listen, we took our insulin 20 minutes early. We ran around the block. We skipped the french fries. Can you just meet us halfway? Hey, did you just go low carb on us? You look amazing. And you know we can never stay mad at you. Get over here. So obviously these post-meal spikes are a big problem, whether you have type 1 or type 2. And Steve has a great case just to you know show this as an example. So Steve, walk us through this. Yeah, real briefly, if you look at the CGM download metrics, Sarah, her average blood sugar over the past month is 141. Her estimated A1C is 6.7, excellent. Her time and range is 78% with very low percent of lows. But if you look at one issue, which is standard deviation. That's the degree of bounce, and you don't want a lot of bounce, and you want that number below 50, and hers is 61. So if you go to her 24-hour profile, it, it doesn't take a rocket scientist like Jeremy and myself to realize that she's doing pretty darn good except lunchtime. Yeah, and I mean, it's pretty easy to see, like you said. And what's the issue um, when you go high after a meal? Well, first of all, you're frustrated you're high, but then what do you do? You do a correction dose and then you go low and you eat everything in the fridge and you get on that diabetes roller coaster. Yeah. So how do you avoid those low or those highs in the first place? Well, let's talk about some big categories. So first let's talk about food. And people say low carb. Is that a good way to prevent these post-meal spikes? You know, it is extremely important. Not everybody can be on the Atkins diet. We don't expect people to be. But just to be a little bit conscious about how you can substitute foods you like with lower carb options. So Sarah here, she eats rice and vegetables for lunch. And I said, what about cauliflower rice? She goes, yeah, I like cauliflower rice, but it doesn't fill me up. So I said, make half cauliflower rice and half regular rice. So it's as, a, as a first step. Yeah, so you can limit the number of carbs that you eat per meal. You know, when I say low-carb meals, anything 30 grams or less per meal is pretty low. So that's one. But if you don't want to do that, you can sometimes delay the carbs that you're going to eat. If you have chicken and vegetables and rice, eat the rice last. Does that really work? It does, actually, because it basically just gives your insulin more time to work. But the thing that I do that Steve always gives me a hard time about <laughs> is I kind of just graze a little bit more. So if I have a sandwich, I never really eat the whole thing in one sitting because that's just a big wallop of glucose coming in. Jeremy, in the nose, you see it says spreading the calories. Yeah, well, that's what I do. You know I, what? I just I like to give you grief. a graveyard of half sandwiches around, you know, the office. <laughs> so if I eat half a sandwich, wait, see you do. what it does to my blood sugars, and then I kind of eat the other half, and Steve just kind of does like the Hoover but, vacuum. But you the eat thing. the first half so fast. Yeah. So okay. anyway, One delay minute. your carbs. So that's kind of, you know, kind of food approaches. So when we talk about meds, you know, kind of medication approaches, the number one tip is what we call pre-bolusing, taking ah. your insulin before you eat. It, At least 10 minutes, honestly, more like 15, 20 minutes 10. before you eat. But in reality, it depends what your blood sugar is. The higher your blood sugar, the longer you should so you wait. you said 10, you mean it should be longer. Definitely should yeah, be I longer. Yeah, I said at least 10. You gotta listen to me. 10 sounds like 11 could be good. Okay. <laughs> no, 20 to 30 minutes. And if your blood sugar is 250, you should wait until your blood sugar starts to drop before you eat. But we, wanna, we don't wanna make it too complicated. Yeah. The timing is key. So if you don't know what you're gonna eat, the whole dose at least takes some insulin, at least 10 minutes, ideally 20 to 30 minutes before you eat, at least something. Get that on board because it takes insulin that long to start working. Mm -hmm. um, so that's good. Well, we should mention a Frezza. You're right. A Frezza, you can take sooner to the meal. Yeah. Inhaled, inhaled insulin. insulin. It works almost immediately. And then Lily has their faster acting umalog called Lumjev. 
and Novo has their faster acting Novolog called Fiasp. So there's some faster acting insulins out there now that are great options to check out. For you type twos out there, we're very jealous. There's some <laughs> great medications that you can take that are not insulin that can help with these post meal spikes. We talk about them all the time, two big classes. One's called GLP-1 receptor agonist, and the other is called SGLT2 inhibitors. So yeah. the first group, Trulicity, Ozembic, SGLT2, it is like Jardiance and Farziga. Mm -hmm. So definitely asking your, 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 your provider about these medication options are great ways to help take care of these post-meal spikes. And then what about um, CGMs? You know, you mentioned yeah, your patient. Yeah. What kind of actual practical CGM advice did you give her? Jeremy, you know this is my deal. Mm -hmm. You have to change your alerts and your alarms. And I urge my patients to lower their upper alert to 150 as an example. So when you go high, at, whenever you cross 150, you're alerted about yeah, it. Yeah, and I go, yes. I've seen them do it. In the old days, when it went above 180, I said, S-H-I-T. But then you have to look at the trend arrow. If it's going up, you give yourself a little correction bolus. If you're a type 2, you do some non-pharmacologic things, like maybe taking a few uh, flights of stairs. And the other thing is, is that you have to really respond to the trend arrows appropriately. So you're saying being notified early, as soon as you go above 150, you can react. If you're going up really fast, take a little bit more insulin or walk a little bit, whatever. But that information is key. So you got food options, you got new medication options, insulin timing, and CGM tricks to hopefully get you off that roller coaster, avoid those post-meal spikes. And you know what? I'm actually starving. So hey, let's go eat. Check out our video <laughs> vault for more complete lectures on this topic. Totally, Thanks, everybody. Enjoy your hot fudge Sunday. See ya.